Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to my distinguished panelists, the co uh, my uh, distinguished convener and moderator, uh, it is a pleasure to join this panel for this most timely discussion. The hope for prosperity that usually attends the start of a new year has long been tempered by the challenges of 2020, and we've only been a week and a half in. 2020 continues to cast long shadows, and we now are faced with this reality. Indeed, the economic prospects for the Caribbean have worsened as the region continues to grapple with the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. A snapshot of the region in 2020, drawing on data from ECLAC and other sources highlights, among other things, a decline in FDI by nearly 45 to 55%, estimated to be its lowest since 20, 2005, an estimated 23% reduction of foreign trade while at the domestic level, the revenue from international trade was down some 32%, near cessation of tourism and airline movements for almost the entire year, resulting in an almost 100% contraction of the hospitality sector, with travel tax receipts falling by nearly 80%, and debt to GDP ratios for the majority of the Caribbean that are above the 60% threshold for sustainability and for three countries in excess of their GDP. Admittedly, while the prognosis is somewhat better now than initially forecast when we entered this crisis, the stark reality is that systemic deficiencies exist and have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Already high deficits and debt in the region have ne negatively impacted the ability of countries to address daily operations of government, much less to finance development and achieve the SDGs. Furthermore, being the second most climate vulnerable region in the world, we bear the recurrent cycle of capital cost and indebtedness caused not by profligacy, but infrastructure damage caused by severe weather events many of which do not even reach international headlines. These circumstances collectively ground our unique vulnerability and our belief in the need for reclassification of our economies for the purposes of determining access to grant funding, the terms and, cost, uh, and costs of debt, and other re related matters so intrinsic to recovery. In Jamaica, our situation was significantly buffered by the positive macroeconomic adjustments made immediately prior to the pandemic, or rather in the years leading up to the pandemic. Our strategic avoidance of full lockdowns in response to the pandemic, recognizing the realities of our societal and economic structures, together with the passage of legislation to adjust fiscal rules, also served us well. Given the continued fallout from the pandemic and the reality of our protracted economic crisis, it is noteworthy for our region that the issues of development financing and debt sustainability have been brought to the forefront of the international community's focus. While global leadership acknowledges that no one must be left behind, there have been no debt relief initiatives or new funding solutions allocated for middle-income countries like those in the Caribbean. In addition, there appears to be limited interest among advanced and developed countries to provide additional funding, either through special drawing rights allocation and or World Bank capital increases. Accordingly, many middle-income countries continue to face the very great and grave possibility of a systemic debt crisis with many sovereign and corporate defaults in the 2021-22 financial period, and perhaps even in the medium term. In the totality of these circumstances, it is of great importance that we move expeditiously towards forging a fresh consensus, a global consensus, in respect of the classification of middle-income countries, including small island developing states of the Caribbean. As we bring our various pers perspectives to the possible modalities of a new classification for Caribbean economies, I wish to just share a few points for consideration. Firstly, we have long maintained our position on revamping the designation and our graduation of states by integrating vulnerability metrics. Put simply, GDP alone does not give a true reflection of development status nor the fragility of an economy, especially in the Caribbean. During the current pandemic, such calls have taken on an 
additional urgency, presenting perhaps an opportune time for the international community to revisit and change the development financing landscape for small states and in particular vulnerable countries such as exist in the Caribbean. That we could now use a, metrics that, a metric that is truly fit for purpose. Secondly, broad acceptance in the global financial community is important for this as any other new responding initiative. We very much hope that the participation of relevant agencies and institutions, including the UNDP, in this important dialogue will promote the level of sensitization required to facilitate the creation of a reliable vulnerability index to be used to rank all countries based on a set of agreed parameters. This index would need to be transparent, dynamic, and allow for easy comparison across countries. Thirdly, we do not need to start from scratch. Work has been done in this area, but there's nothing like an idea whose time has come. The case for advancing the use of vulnerability and resilience indices for use in development financing was most recently made in September 2020 at the high level forum convened by the Commonwealth Secretariat and the Alliance of Small Island States. The forum encouraged the United Nations to work more closely with the Commonwealth Secretariat, EOSIS, the Caribbean Development Bank, Pacific Island Forum, and other multilateral agencies to this end. Jamaica continues to encourage this engagement and also examined this approach in the context of our Financing for Development initiative co-convened with Canada in the context of the UN and which was just referred to. Fourthly, Jamaica reaffirms our long-term commitment to fiscal responsibility and prudent economic management. While calls continue to be made for IFIs and credit rating institutions to make policy adjustments which acknowledge the fallout from the pandemic and prevent further economic failure, we do believe that the Caribbean must also continue to set and maintain benchmarks for fiscal responsibility, provide enabling environments for good business practices to aid job creation and sustainable recovery, and as always, to defend our credibility in what is a highly competitive global environment. Ladies and gentlemen, as I close, the huge task of global recovery from the multidimensional impact of COVID-19 cannot be achieved without measures to address the debt and liquidity issues of vulnerable developing countries. A new system of classification for Caribbean economies will have a cross-cutting positive impact on the rebuilding of our economies and the achievements of the SDGs. Let us harness the opportunity in this crisis. I trust that through continued engagement such as these, we can move expeditiously towards introducing appropriate mechanisms to open up access to vital financial resources. This is absolutely necessary for recovery. I thank you.